Thank you all for joining this afternoon. In this last session of today, I want to give you a little bit of insights on our recent web security technology. My name is Levin de Smet. I am from the K11 here at the University in Leuven. And within my presentation, I will touch upon a lot of technologies that already other speakers have been mentioning, like Jim, like Philip. Uh, we are talking about CSP, we're talking about sandboxing. We will see all those different technologies coming together. And what I want to do today is actually giving you some more context on how to use those technologies giving you some more insights in how to do it, how to configure them, and also some background information deployment. How popular are they already? Which sites are already using this technology? So myself, I'm a research manager at the university. I'm also actually very involved in OWASP, and you saw already yesterday the OWASP organization with, with two great talks. And I'm also the program director of SACABDEV Leuven. I work in the university, and we are with a team of around 70, 80 researchers. We're working on secure software, distributed software, and we have a dedicated team working on web application security. And we're working on a lot of topics in web security, and we actually bundled all of the information together in a document, The Truth Deliverable, which is actually a handbook on web application security. It gives a good overview about the different vulnerabilities, uh, the web security mitigation techniques, um, the recent research and standardization activities within, within this area, and also a list of best practices for each of the vulnerabilities that are in web security. It's freely downloadable, so please pick, your, pick the site, go and look it, and maybe some of the technology mentioned in there might be interesting for your company. So, but today we're talking about recent web security technology. Um, we have already heard about several top end lists like the Sun's Top 25, we're talking about OWASP top 10. Well, in this talk, I won't focus on those list of vulnerabilities or uh, weaknesses within web security. What I want to focus on today is actually how we can actually deploy additional technology at our server, which is configuring the security enforcement on the client side. So we're talking about security policies, as mentioned already in the first talk by George, and we will see how this technology pushed by the server can actually be enforced on the client side. So this is actually an additional layer of defense. You still need all the uh, secret coding guidelines within your web security application, but this is actually providing you an additional layer of defense from the infrastructure, from your web server towards your browser. We're also focusing in this talk on the client-side environment. So I will not focus on any attack, or any vulnerability within your server-side environment. So SQL injection and the, and the like are out of question here. Also, we will not break authorization on the server-side. We're looking at how to actually secure the browser because the browser is becoming more and more a target of the attacks in web security. So if you see the picture, we have normal HTTP traffic coming by from the web, server, web browser to the server back and forward. What technology we're looking today? Well, security policies defined by the owner of the application, by the one actually deploying the application, is pushing that information along with the responses of the web application towards the client-side environment and actually the browser is responsible for taking that policy and enforcing that on the client machine. That's the technology we're talking about today. So how is the rest of the talk structured? I will start with a very, very small introduction because the, the security web model is already much more talked about in Philip's talk. Then I will go to more secure browser server communication, how to actually enhance the secure communication, how to go to a TLS and all the weaknesses according to that. Next, we're focusing much more on injection attacks, the cross site scriptings of this world. The third part is more on framing content securely, how to actually protect against clickjacking. And then in the last step, I will actually combine several of the technologies I discussed today in showing you how you could combine those technologies to build up a secure web architecture. So that's the content for today. So first, a small introduction. We already heard that the basic security policy for the web is the same origin policy. I will not redefine how the origins are, what actually is the purpose of the same origin policy, but I want to look what, are the what is the impact of the same origin policy in integrating content, both via scripts or via iframes. It's just a recap of what we saw on Tuesday. If you're actually using scripts from remote third parties in our code, from the security point of view within your web browser, there's actually no difference. It is as if the third party script was delivered as part of your web application that the website owner was pushing that script is executing in your security context. Whereas if you're working with frames, we're actually integrating frame from a third party. It means that that frame has its own security context 
namely the security context of the origin where the, came from, uh, the iframe came from. And that means that there is actually a, a strict boundary between the outer frame coming from your website and the inner frame from the third party. And there's selective communication between those two security contexts. This is the basic security model. We don't need any more information to understand the rest of the talk, I think. So the first thing I want to discuss is how to secure the browser communication to between the browser and the server. And we're focusing here on two types of attacks, namely session attacks, how the attacker actually wants to steal or to fixate your session identifier and session management, and also how we can actually try to break your SSL or TLS protected connection. We're looking at several countermeasures in this section. We see how we can actually use SSL TLS, how we can actually protect our cookies, how we can make sure that we are using TLS at any time for our website, and how we can actually make sure that also the certificate is not replaced by a, a rogue uh, CA certificate. So this is the content of this block. The network attacks, you heard already before of them. You have a web browser, you have a web server. If you're just using plain HTTP, you're sending around sensitive information, for instance here, the cookie information representing that user in the state between the, the client and the browser, and any attacker that actually takes over that cookie can also work on behalf of the victim. So the attacker is actually reading out that cookie and is actually replaying that cookie in his own session with the web server impersonating the victim. Okay, we all know about this problem. There can be several variations. You could also try the web server actually to fixate the cookie being used. There are several alternatives, but the main uh, solution to this is we actually make sure that we're using a secret channel. We use HTTP, HTTPS requests between the web browser and the web server. So here the green actually indicates that you're pushing by those requests over a secret channel. And of course, this should fix it. Is there, with this solution, is a problem cured? Well, actually, for most websites, it's not cured. And we will see in different steps why it's not cured yet. So the first thing is, well, as LTLS, it might be a very good uh, way of actually protecting your communication over the web. But it turns out that only a fraction of the websites that we are using are actually using TLS or providing TLS to the customers. So this is an older statistic for 2010 from Qualys, but still actually quite accurate in the number of TLS protected websites. We can say for the 1 million most popular websites worldwide, here around 30% are actually providing their customers with the TLS enabled connection. But there are still problems. Even for the websites issuing TLS connections, also, there can be some problems. And we will actually look at three different problems. The first one is what are actually mixing both HTTP and HTTP connections to the same website. The second one is actually what are actually are using a TLS connection from the browser to the server, but they are trusting other resources over HTTP. And also, the bootstrap process of actually bringing website uh, 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 visitors towards TLS, where we can break that with SSL stripping attacks. So, but the first one, mixed use of HTTPS and HTTP. The problem is in the context of HTTPS, HTTP usage of your uh, websites, that cookies are bound to domain names. You're actually issuing a cookie for, for instance, domain example.com, but it's actually not bound to an origin. What does it mean within the security model of the web? If you're accessing the same website over HTTP and over HTTPS, you're actually issuing the same cookie. So even if the cookie is actually also transmitted over a secure channel, any request going over the same line uh, using the HTTP version of your web application will leak out the same cookie. And this is by default. And there's one very simple way of actually making sure that that doesn't happen, and it's actually making sure that you're actually issuing the secure flag, as already mentioned by Philip and Jim earlier this week. So this is actually really something you should enable by default if you're using a TLS-enabled website. Make sure that the cookies that are sensitive are only sent over HTTPS, and the CQ flag will actually instruct the browser, this cookie should only be used over an encrypted channel. So how many websites are actually already doing this? Well, if you're looking to the TLS-enabled websites within Belgium, the most popular ones, uh, we see that around 10% uh, of the websites are actually using the CQ flag. So it means that around 90% of the websites in Belgium are not protecting their cookies or their session identifiers in a mixed mode. So I'm giving some examples during my presentation. This is actually the results of our own experiments. And you will typically see that we have statistics to actually indicate how many of the websites are actually using this technology, yes or no. And also, whenever there are websites using the technology, 
we have a top 10 of the most frequent uh, responses we received within our experiment using this technology. In some cases, we'll see that the list is less than 10. That means that there were less than 10 websites in our experiment actually using this technology. So maybe a little bit uh, uh, more background information on this experiment. So these are experiments we're doing in our lab on a quite regular basis. So we, what we try to do is actually seeing what is the state of practice on the internet. And we're actually visiting the most popular websites uh, worldwide, for instance, in a certain context. And in the experiment I'm presenting today, we're actually focusing on the websites that are most visited from Belgium. So how do we collect or how do we know which are the most popular websites? For that, we're actually relying on the Alexa lists. Alexa is a toolbar installed in a lot of browsers, and they're actually publishing which are the most popular websites worldwide. And they're also splitting up it by region or by country. So it's a little bit skewed because not all the users are actually using that toolbar, of course, but it gives you at least some indication which are the popular websites worldwide, which are the most popular websites in a certain region. And for this experiment, we actually asked the most popular websites in uh, Belgium. And from those websites, we're actually making sure that we're actually indexing the most uh, important pages uh, via... Uh, what we do is actually we have a list of domains, and it's around 2,500. We then go to any search engine, and we ask, give us the top 200 pages of that website. And that's actually the result here. Of those 2,500 uh, domains, we actually have around 300,000 pages that we actively visited with our, uh, within our experiment. So as you will see, not all the websites actually have 200 pages, and the distribution of how many pages were visited per website is actually illustrated in this graph. So most of the websites are actually having between 150 and 200 pages, but you see that some websites even have only 10 pages indexed by a search engine. The search engine used in this experiment is Bing, but we could use other engines as well, as long as they have an open access and actually doing so much queries. We see, of course, we have around 123 pages per domain. Uh, within this collection of domains and data we were receiving, we also focused on the TLS-enabled websites, and we see about 20% of the domains were actually serving pages over HTTPS. When we were requesting to Bing explicitly pages served over HTTPS, we see that we retrieved much less pages uh, being received and indexed over HTTPS. Most of them have actually have less than 10 pages being indexed in Bing over an SSL connection. So again, we saw earlier experiments around 30% of the websites using TLS. This experiment is much fresher and we still see that it's around 20% of the websites actually offering pages over TLS. Maybe one more thing I want to tell about this experiment. This experiment actually dates back from August 2013 and we are actually doing this on a regular basis. So last year I had results from uh, January and we see actually the same patterns uh, reoccurring. So we only see that some of the new technologies are adapted a little bit more but the traction is not that big yet. Okay, with this we already know that not all the websites are using TLS. We even saw that only 10% of them are actually using the seeker flag. What are the other problems we see? Well, one of the other problems is actually mixed content. So even if the user and the server are using a seeker connection and they are doing it for all that traffic, we see that often websites are actually saying, well, we need scripts, images, uh, style sheets, coming from HTTP-only domains. So domains that only offer the content over HTTP. The problem with that is if any attacker on the network is not focusing anymore on the TLS protection connection, but is actually focusing on that second connection going out from your browser, he can actually replace that iCandy.js coming from the script provider with something he owns. That script is integrated in your page. It's running in the same security context. By then, he actually can take over the whole client side of the secure connection. So he could issue requests coming from the browser to the server. He can read out all the data being transferred over the line being rendered in your browser. So it actually renders your HTTPS connection useless at the moment you're including uh, unprotected content. A lot of uh, uh, website uh, web browsers are actually aware of this problem. And we saw in the last six months, uh, all desktop browsers actually taking over this problem actually protecting mixed content of actually being executed in your browser. I think that's a very good idea. Uh, you see that most of the new browsers are actually protecting it on the desktop space. We did a similar experiment on uh, the mobile space, and I think there only the latest version of Chrome on Android and uh, Windows Mobile were actually protecting against this type of attack. So still there, a lot of mobile users are not protected against mixed content attacks. To give you an idea how many websites are actually 
misusing or not adapting correctly mixed content. Well, we crawled for that 100,000 domains worldwide, the most popular domains worldwide. We crawled around 500,000 pages. And we actually saw that we found 20,000 or less than 20,000 TLS protected websites. And of those, 43% of actually were including HTTPS con uh, HTTP content in the HTTPS connection. And even more, 26% of them were actually using scripts, which is awful because that means you could easily take over the whole website. And we saw really, really big companies issuing their scripts over HTTP. A little bit more about this experiment. Uh, we, we tried to see, is it actually only the very popular websites are doing great and all the rest is not doing as good? Uh, this is actually per 10,000. So we actually say the most popular on the left side, the less popular are grouped on the right side. And we see that the distribution is almost equally. So if it's a very good site or less good, well, actually are less popular, they're doing in the same uh, ballpark with respect to mixed content. Giving that information that we could classify on certain characteristics, we did a similar characterization on the type of website that was actually being in use. And, and there we actually have different categories according to McAfee's web database. And the information we see here is, for instance, quite interesting. A government and military, we see a, a much better performance. Only 20% of them are actually including mixed content. Within the entertainment sector, we see up to 40% are using mixed content. So it's not abnormal. I was expecting that certainly with the military, they were doing better than with the entertainment sector because their functionality really rules about secu uh, over security. What's interesting in this picture is the finance sector. Here I was expecting a much better performance than what I see here. I can't even differentiate between business, internet services, or the banking sector, or not that much, which is an interesting idea. And also in our experiments, we saw even local Belgian banks suffering from this problem in our experiments. Okay, for mixed content, I will display some of the possible countermeasures later on when we're discussing C uh, CSP, but I just want to, to give you the flavor, even if websites are using TLS or HTTPS, the problem might not be solved. There might be other problems within their application code. And one of the other problems in deployment is actually the way we go from HTTP to HTTPS, so the whole bootstrapping problem. When your web browser and web server are communicating, what typically happens in practice is the web browser is getting a, a URL within a uh, URL bar. Typically, you're just omitting HTTP. You just say, I want to go to facebook.com. You're entering it. The web, server, web browser is issuing an HTTP. The web server says, I'm also reachable on HTTPS. And from that moment on, the web browser will actually use a CQ connection. But this is actually a very interesting idea because also an attacker could actually exploit this. And I will say it in, in, within one slide. The ways you redirect, just to give you a flavor of that, there are different ways. You could use the response header 301, 302 to actually redirect you to another resource. You could also do it in the meta deck. You could also do it via JavaScript. And we see all flavors being actually actively used within web applications. So how does an attacker actually break this connection? Well, the web browser is actually issuing an unprotected HTTP request to the web server. The web server is actually receiving it but there's a man in the middle, network attacker, is actually having control over the network. Whenever the web server is sending back, you should go to HTTPS. The web attacker says, interesting, but I don't want to know, let that know to the web browser, to the victim. So he's just issuing a HTTP response, go to this page. The web browser didn't see the redirect to HTTPS, so he's continuing to have his communication over HTTP, where the attacker actually has control over all the traffic passing by but the attacker itself issues HTTPS to the web server so that the web server could not differentiate between an attacker or non-attacker connection. And this is something that was presented by Moxie and Morin Spike at Black Hat 2009, and it's called SSL stripping. So you're actually stripping away SSL from the client-side connection. Normally, you would go and be upgraded to HTTPS, but by this technique, the client doesn't is not notified that there's actually an HTTPS waiting for him. Recently, there was actually technology to actually make sure that SSL stripping goes away. And the idea is, as long as you have a connection over HTTPS, you could actually notify the browser, next time you come to my website, make sure that you don't start with HTTP and bootstrap up to HTTPS, but always use my website over HTTPS. And to do so, you're actually issuing a response header, and it's called, it's called strict transport security. You're saying for what period of time you're actually only reachable over HTTPS, 
and instructs any request to that particular domain should always be issued over HTTPS. You have no HTTP connection going out from your browser. And you could even say, well, I'll only do it for my particular website, but within the same line, you could also say for all the domains of my website, the same information holds as well. So by just simply issuing this transport header, you're actually making sure that all the communication in the future to your website will become HTTPS. Back to deployment, if you're looking to the top 2,500 websites visit from Belgium, we see that around 4% are actually using this type of technology if they already have a TLS protected website and you see some of the popular names actually passing by in this list. So one of the problems we have of course here is we said the bootstrapping is worrisome because the, in the bootstrapping the attacker could already say you're only having HTTP communication and it could strip away the request header. So what's the solution for that? Well, the browser com comes already preloaded uh, with a list of domains that are only reachable over HTTPS. And you could even ask the Chrome Chromium team to include your website on that list as well. So this is the way that they're actually trying to, to fix the bootstrap. But the main idea of this technology is I don't think it's, it's really vulnerable because of the bootstrap. Because it's actually, if you're already browsing at home to a certain website or to your company website, the moment you come in a network that is much more vulnerable to such network attacker, like here the open Wi-Fi, you're already protected because your browser already knows that you actually only visit that website over HTTPS. But still, if you're using this technology within your company, just make sure that you're already preloaded in the browsers. One caveat, the moment you're using such a technology, for a certain lifespan, you're not able to reverse back to HTTP. So bootstrap and test for a longer time before you're actually issuing that as preloaded configuration within a browser environment. Also, if you're bootstrapping it in your own company, you might think about having a very short max age to start from that only for like 10 seconds or an hour or unreachable before issuing it for like 24 hours or a whole week to the whole community. Okay, so we actually have HSTS making sure that our TLS connection is end-to-end -end only being contacted over SSL. The next thing is, of course, can we trust our CA? Because we saw in the, uh, in the history in 2001, for instance, uh, 2001, 2002, uh, 2011, 2012, there were several incidents by rogue certificates from rogue CAs or broken-in CAs. And the question is, of course, can you actually uh, be sure that if you're connecting to a server, a CA certificate is actually uh, CA is uh, issuing a certificate from that server and your browser recognizes it, it is okay. And the solution for that is actually, once you're actually communicating to a party that you trust, you can actually store information about that server certificate for the next visit you go to the same party. And this is actually what the keeping technology is actually providing. As a server, you could say, every time you visit me for a certain period, these are actually fingerprints of the certificates from our server side. So every time you visit me and the certificate doesn't have this fingerprint, don't make a connection to me because it will be a rogue certificate that is used on the other side. Again here, you have an max age for which is actually alive. What's important in this specification is that you always need at least two fingerprints to be identified. The reason for that is you could actually, one of the uh, certificates could be compromised or you could actually have a problem with one of the servers and your certificate is lost. So you always need a backup certificate to make sure that your service is reachable. And it's also a good idea to always have a backup certificate that you can actually, that is not actively in use, but can be used whenever you need it in a backup situation. So it actually freezes the whole chain from the CA to your certificate and actually caches that on the client side. But it's very recent technology. Uh, it's only being supported in Chrome at this moment and it's still an internet draft. But we're expecting this to actually be more popular within the next years and actually reaching out to all the other browsers as well over the coming years. So this actually is fixing step by step the bootstrapping problem. How can you actually trust the other side? And the main idea is that the browser is actually doing the enforcement and caching some information for future connections between the client and the server. So a small recap, we were looking to securing the communication between the client side and the server side. We were looking to use TLS. Uh, we saw that there's a slow adoption rate and it has different reasons why it's actually being adopted slowly. Uh, it could be performance, it could be the overhead in management, it could be also the caching that is actually uh, disabled. But what we see that's uh, important in using TLS, if you're switching to TLS, 
Also take into account that you might still include uh, HTTP only resources in your browser, making sure that your TLS connections then can be circumvented. If you're using TLS, also make sure that you're using the secret flag for your cookies so that your session management is actually separated from your HTTP part of the website. You issue the HSTS header to make sure that SSL stripping attacks will not happen. And if necessary, you can also pin your uh, certificate to the browser environment. So this is the first part of my uh, session today. If there are any questions about securing the client side, server side communication, please feel to interrupt me now. You can actually interrupt me at any moment in the presentation, but I think it's a good moment to actually close down the first part before continuing. How many browsers implement the, the pinning of the certificate? So only one. Uh, so at this moment, I think only Chrome is supporting it. Uh, I might have to relook, but I think uh, month, two months ago, I only found supporting Chrome for that. Okay, could be. So, so I, I did see that they were starting support. I didn't test it recently. Could be that they're actually even saying that they no longer support it. There are alternatives in this area of, of research and, and uh, ongoing activities. One of them is actually storing information about all the certificates you see passing by. So actually making a kind of um, write append only log of the certificates you see passing by to see if you certain of the certificates are not fitting in that collection. Um, so I'm not sure. It could be that Chrome, even Chrome is dropping this technology. In that sense, don't use public pinning because it will be out of range anyway. <laughs> Good remark. Any other qu uh, questions? Any other remarks? No, then I will continue. So the next block I want to discuss is actually how to mitigate script injection attacks. So already some of the talks uh, in this week were focusing on cross-site scripting, the complexity of actually having uh, cross-site scripting in the web context. Uh, what you have to do on encoding, on validation. What I will present today is actually uh, new or uh, other ways to actually protect against cross-site scripting, but I still want to insist that the other ways of actually doing your input validation correctly, doing your encoding correctly, still remain. It's only an additional layer of defense. I think it's most important to also make sure that all the input of the user is never trusted, is always handled before actually using that data in your application. So the attack we're discussing here is cross-site scripting. What I will see is actually the protection to protect your session cookies, as already mentioned before, uh, the browser support to protect against re refractive cross-site scripting, and I spent most of the time on CSP, the content security policy, which is a de facto new internet security policy for the web. This is actually becoming the new large security policy in which browsers are actually enforcing the security constraints of the web server pushed. So, but first, cross-site scripting, I think most of you are already aware how cross-site scripting works. You have an attacker actually, for instance, pushing some payload to the vulnerable server, and this is the stored XSS. That payload is actually pushed to all the victims actually requesting uh, content from the vulnerable server, and it's executing within your JavaScript context. So what is important to notice here is a lot of the cross-site scripting attacks, um, the first thing they try to do is actually stealing your cookie. Because stealing your cookie means that they can impersonate you from any moment in time. But of course, there's only one fraction of the attacks that will happen. They can actually run any arbitrary request from your client-side context without stealing the cookie. They could even run complete frameworks. And one of the frameworks that they can run is, for instance, Beef, which is actually really a browser exploitation framework. And there's even a chain you could actually load Beef via a simple XSS. With that browser exploitation framework, you could do all kinds of attack, navigate the browser wherever you want but you could even couple that with Metasploit and use actually Beef and Metasploit to attack the local machine, to attack the local network. So cross-site scripting is only the first way to get into a web browser, and from there on you could actually do all the exploitation you want with Beef, with uh, Metasploit, with any other technique, for instance, attacking your operating system, attacking the plugins in your, in your environment, you actually you're free to go. In the first countermeasure, I'm only giving you some countermeasure to protect your session cookies, and this is actually a very small solution because you're not protecting all the other cases where XSS can actually leave uh, to bad trace. How does it work? Very similar to the secure flag, you could also actually issue the HTTP only flag. What it does is actually making sure that only the cookie is used in communication between the browser and the server on the transport layer, but it's not being used in actually uh, in, the, in the interaction with your JavaScript context. So if you are actually requesting from your JavaScript context, give me the cookies, or am I allowed to actually write a new cookie? 
the HTTP only flag will make sure that this is actually non-writable, non-readable from a JavaScript context. And by this, even if you could inject JavaScript within your browser context, you're not able to read out, to hijack the session cookie, you're not able to fixate the cookie. But of course, you could still issue new requests, you could do additional XHR to use actually the browser environment and to do all your uh, malicious activities directly from the browser. To give you an idea how many of them are actually already doing that for the session cookies, we see that the adoption rate is much higher, around 35% 35, 35 of the websites are using HTTP only flags for at least one cookie in their domain. Another way to protect against one specific subset of cross-site scripting is the support that is already provided in your browser. So uh, both Internet Explorer, Chrome, WebKit are actually having support already in the browser to protect against one specific flag flavor of cross-site scripting, namely reflected. It means whenever the JavaScript that you want to inject in your page is actually part of your URL, if you see the resemblance between the script being executed, the script actually being pushed as part of your URL, you will actually block that script from executing. How does it work? It's actually technology within your browser technology itself. It's on by default, but there are also some controls where the server could say, I would like to disable this functionality for this particular website, or I would like to even go a step further, instead of not executing that particular script, just block the whole rendering of my page. And you do that by actually issuing the XSS protection flag. One is what is already default. If you don't issue the, the re response header, it's already the execution that is normal. It will actually try to block the execution of the script, but the rest of the website will still render. With zero, you actually can uh, opt out of that protection. And you could actually also use mode block, which means that the whole page will be prevented from rendering once you have such an attack being detected on the client side. It's not a perfect mitigation technique because there, are only, uh, there have been multiple bypasses reported for any browser implementing such a technology in the past and it's only protecting against one particular flavor of XSS, namely the reflected cross-site scripting. So if you're looking how many websites are actually deploying additional configuration for uh, this XSS protection flag, around 4% are issuing it. In my advice, you don't necessarily need to actually issue this flag unless you actually want this behavior of the blocking mode. And with that, we're actually coming to the core of this presentation. I want to talk about the content security policy. I think the content security policy started off as being a very simple policy as an additional line of defense against cross-site scripting. And as I will tell later in the presentation, I think a lot of other technologies are actually being embedded within the content security policy because it's actually re becoming really popular and becoming very, very powerful as an additional line of defense. So the idea of the content security of policy is again, you issue a header from the server side, the client side needs to enforce it, and what you do in the content security policy is you specify which resources are allowed to be embedded as part of your page. And resources can be actually anything, and we will see further on what are the resources they are focusing on. Uh, we're talking about the fonts being used, we're talking about um, the images, we're talking about scripts, style sheets, all the content that the web page is actually gathering from other resources that can be integrated in your page can be controlled whether they are allowed to lo be loaded or not loaded. And it's a very promising defense, but it's an additional layer of defense. So you should not only rely on this technology, you should actually combine it with other technologies against cross-site scripting, such as encoding and validation. So there's a whole set of directives. We don't go in detail for all the directives one by one, but I just want to give you a good flavor of what's possible. Um, I was having in my presentation that is online, I'm discussing 1.0. Well, today I will present 1.1. It's only being in a new updated draft since Monday, but I will present that because there are also interesting parts in the CSP policy that I surely want to share with you as well. How does a policy work? Well, you start typically from a default source. So you could actually say all the resources, I just combine them together. This is the default for the whole policy. And then you could refine for some of the uh, resources you want to have a much more fine grained uh, issuing. And what you uh, specify in the default source list is actually a list of sources that you want to include. And sources are, could be self, which is the website itself, the origin itself. It's actually none if you don't want to include anything apart from the page itself. Or you could actually give a list of origins. And, and here are an example list of origins. But I think with all the other talks talking about what is an origin, I think by now you already know what origins are all about. Mind the wildcards you can use. So you can even say, 
well, whatever protocol being used, as long as it's this domain, this is something that you can express within CSP. You could even <coughs> say, I don't care to which websites, as long as it's over HTTPS, this is also something that you could uh, mention. Uh, you could also use subdomains if necessary. And your sources can actually be space delimited, could have multiple of those entries for each of the directives I will discuss. So how could you refine? Well, depending on the resource you want to uh, specify and have a more fine-grained policy, you could override the default source. You could do that for scripts, which is all the JavaScripts being embedded in your page. You could do that for all the Flash and other plugins. You could do that for style sheets, images, video and audio. And you could even say, if it's allowed, to actually load iframes as part of your website itself. You could also say, from where you're actually trusting to load web fonts. And you could also say, and this is the only one that's actually working in the other direction, you could also say to which websites you're actually allowed to connect. So although all those are actually embedding content within your page, with the connect, you're actually saying to which websites you can connect with XHR, with WebSockets, and all the technology for communication. I grayed out two options. I will not discuss them here because they come later on in my presentation. Both of them are now part of the specification of 1.1 of CSP. So we saw an interesting technology. Basically, it says what is you allowed to be loaded as part of your page. How does it help against cross-site scripting? Well, this will actually make sure that a drive-by download is no longer possible because it's not allowed to connect to other websites. It's not to allowed to actually arbitrary JavaScript to be loaded as part of your page. But there's even more. In order to use CSP, it requires your website to behave. And what do we understand under behave in the CSP and the content security policy context? Well, there are some quite interesting restrictions in how you can build up your application. So the first one is you could use, you can't use anymore inline scripts or inline CSS. Already mentioned by uh, Jim, I think on Wednesday or on, on Tuesday, it's not a good practice to actually use inline scripts, inline style sheets. Well, CSP forbids whenever you're actually trying to use CSP, by default, you don't want inline scripts and CSS to be loaded anymore because those actually would circumvent the whole information uh, or the whole infrastructure with CSP being enabled. The advantage is you have very clean separation. You have your styles separately, you have all the functionality on JavaScript separately, and you have actually your page only containing the markup, actually how it should be rendered in your page. And secondly, another restriction, you're not allowed to use eval anymore. And this might be much harder. I think we heard already in the, in the session of uh, Tom, um, there might not be that many good use cases of eval, but still a lot of libraries you're using are using eval. And by doing so, you're actually very limiting the technology being deployed here because suddenly, all of a sudden, eval is no longer allowed to be executed. So all the mimified, obfuscated libraries you're using, well, almost all of them are using eval to actually execute. But on the other hand, it's actually very important to have that uh, restriction because with eval, any string could be transferred to executable code again. So, and that would actually circumvent the whole solution of the content security policy. But we'll discuss some restrictions or some relaxations later on. Firstly, how do we actually make sure that our, our website is behaving to those restrictions? Well, a very, very small HTML page. We have an HTML page with a handler run my script. If you're seeing to the implementation of run my script, it's actually showing an alert. This is actually what's going on in this simple HTML page. This is something that is not allowed with CSP anymore. And how can we actually convert this page to a page that is compliant with CSP? Well, the first thing is we will actually make sure that we have HTML page and we are only linking external JavaScript in our page. So inline JavaScript is no longer allowed. We can only externalize our JavaScript and link that JavaScript as part of our page. Secondly, we're actually starting um, the JavaScript page itself. We still have all the code that we actually want to execute as part of our application. And we need some kind of binding actually making sure that all the event listeners are coupled to the right place. So remember on the previous page, we see here we're using the onclick handler. Now, if you want to actually bind functionality to the particular page here, we have to actually look up the item where we want to link for, uh, link for and then add an event listener click to actually make sure that that function is, click, uh, is run on that handler. So it's a little bit more effort. On the other hand, now we have real clean separation we have the code itself or a whole library. 
we have the binding to how to use that to a particular page, and we have the page itself only having markup. But of course, it's not that easy for existing websites to convert, especially it's not easy for any library we're using to have the same pattern to be used. So we have some relaxations. There are some relaxations that makes it easier for you to take the, the path of transition towards CSP. The first one is we temporarily allow inline scripts. And we can actually define unsafe inline for any particular origin within our script. So we could say, and even as a variation on this policy, for self, it's like this, but for other origin, we are allowing inline scripts. So we could even say we're using jQuery from a remote server. Our website is not allowed to run inline script, but the jQuery is allowed to run inline scripts. We have actually the same for eval. We could actually say for a certain period of time, uh, for certain websites, we're actually allowing eval to be executed. And we have the same for style sheets as well, but in the presentation, I'm not focusing much on style sheets. But be aware, because if you're using this kind of relaxations, you're actually rewinding the whole reason why you're using CSP. You wanted to protect against cross-site scripting. By using inline scripts, by allowing eval, you're back to basis, because at that moment, you could actually execute any string into some executable code via eval. So that was also something that was known to the people working on, on CSP. And they're actually bringing new technology as part of CSP 1.1. And it's actually the use of nonces and hashes. So instead of actually saying, well, we allow the unsafe inline, the unsafe eval, they wanted to actually make sure that there's much more easier for, to use the CSP technology without actually having to reduce the security that they actually want to provide. And the first thing is, for some cases, you want some inline code, uh, inline scripts to be allowed. And you do that by actually putting a nonce as part of your security policy. And you also use that nonce for every script block that is allowed to run in your page. The idea is if an attacker can actually put some random, uh, put some data or some scripts into your page, he will never be able to guess the random nonce. Of course, this random nonce has to change for every page you're issuing at the server side. It has to be random so that the attacker cannot guess what is the nonce being used in your application. But it's very hard for an attacker to actually generate some script that actually has that nonce because he can't guess the nouns, and any other nouns that is used on the website or on your page, any script without the nouns, will still not be uh, executed by content security policy. So this is already a first relaxation, but this relaxation is much safer than just saying uh, allow uh, unsafe evaluations within, or unsafe inlining within my page. A second technology that you can use is actually saying, well, I'm not able to uh, generate the nouns. Uh, I have a large piece of code, but it's quite static, the code I want to include in my application. There you can say, well, actually, from this script source, I'm actually making a hash of the script itself. And as long as the code that I want to inline in my page is actually conforming to that hash, and actually allowing that script to execute. So here, we're actually using SHA-256 to actually having that small piece of code. And that piece of code hash is allowed on the page with this content security policy. So those are two um, variations of the same inline, uh, in, inline uh, is still allowed, but I want to make sure that an attacker is not able to inline arbitrary scripts into your application. Those are two drivers to actually try step by step to mitigate your application to be compatible with CSP, and the next step can be that you actually externalize the inline scripts to an external file. So I think it's actually a transition path rather than this is the way to actually use CSP in the future but this is my personal interpretation of this technology. So maybe some other features that are very interesting within CSP, and then I think really the engineering of CSP comes to play, it's actually the reporting feature. So with CSP, whenever something is happening on the client side that is not conforming to the content security policy you're specifying, you could ask that the server owner gets a violation report. So whenever this policy on the client side is executing, there's some uh, infraction, infringement of your policy, you will actually send some information back to the server saying, this execution on the client side did not happen according to the policy. And this is a very good way of actually tuning or fine tuning your CSP policy, because you could actually see you're including a library, you were not aware that another library needed to be included, or you were not aware that an additional iframe was being loaded. You will be notified, and you actually can adapt your CSP policy accordingly. How to do it? 
as part of your CSP policy, you just say, the report URI is my handler for actually getting in all the uh, information. And actually a simple HTTP post will give you all the information back to the server. So do you have some questions? No, but uh, aren't you with that can't you do a denial of service then? With all the reports if you just flood it. Yeah, but you could do the same denial of service by just having image sources included as well. Um, the idea is actually you don't do any processing real time. You're actually collecting the reports and then you can actually go over the reports to see what is interesting information. But you're, it's true. You could actually say I'm sending information at an arbitrary rate and the attacker can actually control which is the rate. The main idea is actually this gives you more insight in the client side environment. For now, if you had, without the CSP technology, you're issuing some website to the client side. You don't know what's happening. A lot of errors are happening on the client side console. You're not informed about that. With this technology, you're pushing security policy as well with your application, and at least you're informed about the violations. You, you're not obliged, you can say, I just leave out this directive from my policy. But if you, for a certain period of time you want to test out if there are any violations, you can actually issue this directive. But it's true, it can generate quite some traffic as well. It could be if you're misconfiguring your security policy, any page load will actually issue a new HTTP post to your web application. How does that violation look like? Uh, for instance, we have a content security policy saying you are allowed to load scripts from your own page from the Google APIs, and if that's not happening, you're actually reporting back to this particular URL. Then you see, well, um, I'm loading this page. It came from this particular website. This was a resource that was blocked. I violated the fact that I didn't come from uh, apis.google.com. And then you have the whole policy being defined here. So this is actually a way to uh, debug any violation happening with your CSP policy on the client side. Of course, if you're still using this violation, it means that maybe your website, if you intended to load that resource but you forgot in your policy, it still means that the, the website will not render as you were expecting before issuing the security policy. So there's even one step further that you can go and you can actually use CSP reporting only mode. And with that directive, you're actually saying, well, I'm still interested in actually putting up a content security policy, but you're doing two things. You're actually checking the website if there are any violations and you report them back if necessary but you don't enforce the policy. So all the resources are still loaded. And again, this is a transition path. The moment you're actually deploying CSP, you could easily run this for a long time in reporting only mode. You're getting back all the violations. You know how to find in your policy. And if that policy is actually stable, you could say, now we go to the next step where we're actually issuing the full policy to be enforced on the client side. And I think this is actually a very nice engineering feature. Also taking into account how new technology can be deployed in the future where you say, well, we want to see having more introspect what's happening on the client side, but also staging. You can already try out certain client side policies in a whole variety of configurations, getting feedback, and if that is stable, then you issue the policy to the, to the client side and do enforcement. Okay, a lot of information about CSP. Maybe let's take back one step and see to some examples how the CSP policy is being used in practice. Before doing that, are there any questions about CSP that you want to be answered now or having some uh, remarks about how to use CSP? Go ahead. Uh, I will do it, but all the browsers are actually supporting 1.0, uh, the basic uh, CSP, and some of them are already catching up with 1.1 as well. But I will discuss that certainly at the end. So some examples. Uh, how can we use this? Um, I have four small examples just to give you a flavor. And some of the examples are actually inspired by my quest talk on DevOps last year, HTML5 rocks, and there's also a document that he put online uh, on his website. So the first thing, um, we have a lockdown of an, uh, a virtual bank, mybank.net. Uh, what do we want to do? Well, we want to make sure that resources such as scripts, images, and style sheets are allowed to be included from a uh, content delivery network. And that one is actually cdn.mybank.net. This one is actually providing all the static content to the end user. And we also want to actually have a, a very rich uh, Web 2.0 API. We are using XHR and we're doing that with api.mybank.com. So uh, also see here, we're using even different origins, but this is all allowed within the content security policy. It's not limited to only working in your own origin. 
Uh, we are loading iframes, uh, small frames within our website, but they're only allowed to come from our own website. And we are news using no Flash, no Java, no other plugins. So how does the policy look like? Very simple, we say, well, default, we don't have any resource to be included, and I think that's a good default to start from within the content security policy. Then you say for scripts, styles, and images, we're using the CDN. We are allowed to connect back with XHR to the API. And for all the frames that we are loading within our application, child frames, they all have to come from their own origin. This is a very basic uh, setup, and actually directly translating those requirements into the policy. Second one, um, I was discussing earlier on mixed content. We want to make sure that our website is running on SSL only. How can we ensure that with the content security policy? Well, actually, it's very straightforward to ensure, uh, ensure that with the content security policy. You say the default of all the resources on my page have to go over HTTPS. And if you say, well, in first line, because you're not compatible yet with all the restrictions on uh, inline scripts and eval, you could even say, well, scripts and styles, you can still use inline, but then make sure that you repeat that all those resources have to come over HTTPS as well. So it's actually a very good additional technology if some of the browsers are using are already supporting the content security policy, but having a mixed feeling about mixed content. Well, with this, you're actually blocking all the mixed content of actually being loaded as part of your application. But it's more as an example because I think for the desktop browsers who support already the content security policy, they have done a good job in the last year in catching up with mixed content. So if you left off the HTTPS on script source, you could load JavaScript over HTTPS? Yes, indeed. That's the reason why I include this um, uh, example because the whole directive is actually replacing for that particular resource the default. So even if the default source is none, you could still say, well, I'm loading over HTTPS over HTTP. It's really replacing for that particular category everything you know before in the default. Yes? Does this mean HTTPS 7 for our website? No. Uh, if you don't say anything here, it means all the websites that are starting with HTTPS are allowed. And can I combine that with 7? Yeah, you could say, well, actually, um, I'm... I don't think you can combine it. What you have to do then in that scenario, and I, I, I think it's less easy for deployment, you actually specify HTTPS and you actually explicitly specify your own origin. And if the website is reachable over multiple origins, you, you mention them all in, this, in space delimited. But indeed, it, it's not perfect. Uh, this is the way the, the, the sources are defined. But good question. Any other thing? No, we're just saying that the, uh, yeah, the default source is that you don't have other stuff. And that's yeah. the no, it's, it's not a firewall that says this is the first thing to actually interact. It's actually the fall back in a firewall. If any of the other rules are not matching, then I'm falling back to default. And so if, you don't, if you don't have default source at all, is it wide open like this? Yeah, I think. Just like normal. Yeah. So I think if that would not be here, for instance, plugins would be allowed, um, all the things would be allowed. And that's the reason. I, I think that's a good example. This should be the, the, the starting line for writing your policy. And the red ones are actually saying you need to repeat the things that are interesting from the default. Okay, this is only one step, but I think you should take additional steps to make sure that everything goes over SSL. You, you should also actually verify that the code you're using or using SSL, this is only one particular step in deployment that you can use. Okay, another example. Um, I don't spend too much detail. You have social media integration. I think most of the websites nowadays are actually having social media integration. How we start there, uh, we have Google buttons coming from APIs and plus one. We have similar things, iframes from Facebook. We have Twitter. How do co we combine everything together? Well, we say for scripts, we allow both uh, Google and Twitter scripts to be loaded in our website. For the iframes, actually all three are allowed. This is actually reflecting whatever is needed from those is reflected in this policy. And, and this example is more to show that you actually can have a whole list of different origins or different uh, patterns in, in your source list to be combined all by spaces. So maybe one thing that might not be clear from the presentation I've been giving today, I'm using uh, new lines to actually say how the policy looks like. In reality, it's all one line because it's one response header from your application. So it just here for clarity, I make new lines to make it a little bit more readable how the policy looks like, but it's actually one long line being submitted. There's even one variation um, for websites that actually want to actually embed their policy as part of the website itself. And I imagine, for instance, that the popular PHP library was, wants to include this um, 
defense already as part of the application, you could also use the meta tag <coughs> to embed your policy and then attach it to every page. I'm not such a, a fan of actually using the meta tag for the security policy because I'm always thinking of an attacker actually being able to inject metadata as well. Um, I would rather see it as an actually infrastructural way where you actually say the server issues the security policy, but both of the options are fine. And there was some debate between the different vendors what to do, whether actually leaving out the meta tag or including the meta tag. Last example, just a snapshot. This was uh, the CSP policy of uh, Facebook last year, just to give you how complex it can become actually issuing CSP policies. Interesting things here, actually the default source, you can omit this, but it's actually said that by default you can load everything unless it's actually refined later on. Uh, you see that here you have a Chrome extension, and it's actually to allow your Chrome extension to adhere to your policy as well, and here it is the, the, the Skype policy. So the, the Skype extension within Chrome to be loaded. So this is interesting. You see that it's actually a whole setup of how to interact with different uh, extensions. In Chrome now, extensions have to, CSP, have, to have a CSP policy, set, policy themselves as well. But you see for the whole bootstrapping, even if you deploy it on a particular browser, you might have the report only mode to see that certain things are not working so that you actually can make sure that those are working in your updated version. Just try things out. Um, so this was a snapshot. Actually, uh, when I was taking this uh, snapshot, next day I went to, again to Facebook and there was no CSP policy anymore. So I was probably one of those people that they were actually trying out CSP policy. How does it work? And this is just a snapshot. They were configuring it and they were issuing this policy to me. Also see here, they were using the WebKit prefix probably because I was using uh, Chrome, they were issuing that, that to a particular subset of their users just to see what is the reaction, are they still loading the web page, or are they still using resources, and so on. But I would, I, you don't need this one. It would be, have been much more interesting if they say, well, you're connecting over HTTPS, well, it should be also HTTPS, and then they can refine whatever they want later on. Okay. Um, so. I promised also to give you an, a small insight on browser compatibility. Well, actually, I think all the browsers you want to have support in are supported Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, and IE. Um, some of them are still using the older header names like uh, prefixed with XWebKit or the X Content Security Policy, but by now, the Content Security Policy is final, the version 1.0. You just you have to use Content Security Policy. Um, when we are looking to websites actually deploying already this technology, you see a large red fraction and only a very, very tiny green stripe. Actually, only less than uh, half a percent are actually using this technology at this moment. But of course, it's very recent technology, and I expect actually, when I would give the next, the next year the same talk, I would actually expect to like 5 or 10 percent of the, the websites already using this technology, especially the larger websites like Google, Facebook, and so on. So I, I really think it's an interesting technology. Uh, but it's still really, really early in deployment when we are searching on the web. So a small recap on this part of my presentation. Um, we have the HTTP only flag for securing the, the session cookies. A very limited uh, impact of uh, what a cross-site scripting can do. Uh, we saw the XX protection header. It's on by default, but even if you want to configure, you can do it, but it's actually minor in configuration. The most important one is the content security policy additional layer of defense against cross-site scripting. And in the next section, I actually will show you that this is actually the kind of the back of all security policies on the web will actually start to be actually be confined within the content security policy. And what is interesting for me in the content security policy is the report only mode. You can actually test out um, without actually enforcing anything on the client side and getting reports. And even within deployment and actually when actually enforcing the policy, you could still have some information about there are some script attacks within my application. I have to search for them in my code base. Uh, there are some drive-by downloads starting from my application. At least you have some insights in what's going on on the client side. Even if only a fraction of your users is being protected by the technology, at least you have some information that fraction of users was attacked. It didn't execute, but at least I know that something is fishy in this particular part of my application. Good. Before we are going to framing, any questions on content security policy, cross-site scripting, or anything you wanted to know from this part of the application. <coughs> what? Yeah. 
So no, the, if a browser does not support um, CSP, it will not see the header, it will just ignore the header and you can actually add additional headers. Um, I think also with the, the CSP, so the 1.1 is going to, to final draft quite uh, soon. I think when I go to final draft, I also will actually try to issue a version as part of the CSP so that the, uh, a browser that actually sees this version one policy should adhere to the version one policy. But I think um, within the near future, a large fraction of the websites will actually support the latest version of CSP. But all our browsers will just ignore it. All the mobile browsers will probably ignore it for, for some time and that's it. Any other question? Okay, um, then maybe we should go to the last part of this application. Um, it's actually how to securely frame. And we saw in the beginning we have two security models. We could actually include JavaScript and JavaScript can lead to XSS uh, attacks and so on. But what about actually framing content? And why is framing content something important to look at? Well, there's one very important attack. Uh, it's called clickjacking. It's also called UI redressing. It's actually making sure that the user clicks on something he didn't want to click on. And the second part I want to discuss here is we have already seen that there's actually two different security trust uh, zones for the outer frame and the inner frame, but this only holds if the two frames are coming from a different origin. And I will also discuss some technology, what you can do when both of the frames are coming from the same origin from your own website. So I will discuss the Xframe option header, and I will also discuss the sandbox attribute of HTML5. So, click checking, how does it work? I will actually use an older picture from 2010 when I was actually saying a study of click checking vulnerabilities. What to think about for uh, click checking is actually whenever someone is actually clicking on the frame in an application. So this is what actually the user sees, the play. You send around the link, you have some form linking to some popular game, or you're actually having some website under your own control. Whenever a user wants to click, and maybe you just have to say that there will be an image of dancing pigs or any nice YouTube video or whatever, people will start to click. What you do as an attacker is actually making sure that there's an invisible frame in front of your application. You can easily say, well, uh, with the, the Z position, how uh, far in front your, your, your frame has to be. You can make it completely transparent. But whenever the user is actually clicking the play button, your browser will actually, the, the, the frame in front of it will receive the click and will execute something. And by crafting this frame quite nicely on the same place, for instance, you want to link someone in Twitter or Facebook, uh, you want to submit some credentials, or you want to, 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 to for instance, uh, an, uh, a logout, or you want to actually um, delete an account on, on some application, you could craft the user to click on any link in his browser that is actually interesting for the attacker, but the user doesn't notice it, he's just clicking, and he's thinking that he's actually clicking on the, the link below. And I think even with clicking on the outer frame, you could even say in a cascading uh, way, whenever this click is actually processed, that you're actually giving back the click to the frame underneath it, which actually makes it completely transparent for the user that something is happening. So there are some uh, ways where people, uh, when they're realizing that their website could be framed, that they actually wanted to protect it. Think about any page you have on your application that can actually do some state changes on the server side you don't want that any external attacker could navigate and actually manipulate the user to do some stateful transaction on your server. So, and what did people come up with? Whenever they had a page that they don't want to be framed, they came up with some JavaScript. For instance, to check if I'm not the outer frame, make sure that I become the outer frame, uh, make sure that my parent, that I'm self, my, the parent of myself, the, the, the parent is from my own domain. And this kind of technology was purely in JavaScript to protect themselves against uh, uh, frame, frame busting of click checking. Well, let me make sure, don't use this technology because there are so many ways to actually break that technology, that countermeasure, that you really, really shouldn't use it. For instance, uh, with sandboxing technology that we will discuss later on in HTML5, you could easily say, well, this frame, execute it, but disable all the JavaScript execution on that. Well, what will happen with your JavaScript executions? They will not be loaded but your form will still be submitted. You could even say some of the uh, countermeasures or navigating uh, outer frames, this is actually not allowed by your frame navigating policy. You, should, you could make sure that you're embedding a frame and that frame is not capable of actually navigating the outer frames or the top window. And of course also there were some attacks where you actually are using XSS filters 
in your browser that we discussed before that you control ca can control with XSS protection. And they were actually injecting some of the scripts that they were executing as part of the application, as part of the header, for instance, with a hashtag and then something locally. This, the browser says, well, I see the same script in the URL in the browser. I will not execute it because it's unsafe. So they're actually using the same technology to protect your application and actually defeating any protection against clickjacking. So I, I think I made my point clear, don't use this. What do I use instead? Well, there's a nice uh, solution, and it's called XFrame Options. And what you can do with XFrame Options is, again, you send some response header as part of your application page itself, and it actually says to the browser, well, only this origin or this other origin is allowed to load my page. And you have three options. You could say, well, we deny no other application, even if I'm myself trying to frame this uh, particular page is not allowed to frame this page and actually the frame will never be loaded. You could say same origin if you say I have uh, example.com I want to load additional uh, frames from the same website you could use same origin or you could say I'm allowing from one particular URI to be loaded in my page. For instance you have a partner agreement with Facebook or Twitter or whatever they are allowed to frame your particular page then you can say I'm allowed to be framed from that side but not from any other side. Uh, in the world. So mind if I say URI, it's not a source list, it's only one URI. So if you have different partnerships, you actually have to make sure that your frame is actually being uh, issued a different uh, website URL so that you can actually issue a different header for each of the partners. You can differentiate between each of the partners that want to embed your content. Again, if you're looking to the experimental data, how many websites are deploying this? we see that around 7% of them are actually using this technology and most of the websites that are using this technology as part of their website are using it uh, for sensitive parts inside the application once the people are already authenticated or for, for instance for the login form. They're making sure that no other application can use click checking for their login form. You will see that some of the websites are even using it on all the pages that they're issuing from that particular website. So if you have a website and no other website needs to frame your content well, just issue the header and the other websites will not be able to do any click checking attack against your application. But there's also good news. So this is, I said that you can only load it from one page. You already have so many security policies that you have to configure. Well, recently with version 1.1 of the content security policy, you could actually define this kind of countermeasure as part of your count, uh, content security policy. So this is only in version 1.1. And what you do, you have an additional directive frame options. And then you say which of the other websites are allowed or which of the origins are allowed to frame your content. The advantage over the ones you had in uh, XFrame options itself is that you actually can have space delimited different origins to be loaded as part of your application. Um, still, the common advice also in the specification, also by the people that actually are implementing it, it is it might be a good idea to actually differentiate between each of the parts individually. You can easily do that by, for instance, having an additional parameter in your URL saying from which partner uh, that wants to embed the content. And then you do a check server side, is this partner in the list of partners is allowed to be actually include this data and then actually issuing that data. Because otherwise that list could become very long and you're actually exposing all the people that are allowed to embed your content in your page. So actually differentiate for each of the partners that are embedding content from you and give them a different result depending who wants to include your content. So is this clear? So I think very uh, small solution, but actually very handy because the browser is enforcing it. You don't need any JavaScript or any other magic within your page to protect you against uh, click checking. So the second problem I wanted to raise here is what are the limitations of framing content within the same origin? I mentioned already in the introduction, we are actually having a security paradigm where each origin in framing is running a different security context. If you're running in the same origin, it's very easy to navigate from one frame to the other frame and even executing code in the other frame. So you don't have any separation at all. What can you do? Well, within the introduction of HTML5, they were introducing uh, the sandbox attribute. So as part of an iframe, you could actually mention sandbox, or you can even configure the attribute of sandbox with several directives. And there are uh, a very coarse-grained way of actually doing sandboxing of your internal content 
So you can actually only say some of the limitations that the sandbox iframe will have, but this actually working technology also within the origin itself. So even if you're loading page A is embedding page B from your domain, you can say there are all restrictions on page B while being embedded in page A. And this is typically, typically not something that you can achieve with any of the other technology. It's actually providing similar restrictions as what the same origin policy is doing between two different websites. So what is the default sandbox behavior? So what is the behavior if you're just adding the sandbox attribute to your application? The first is all the plugins are disabled. So you can't run plugins within your sandbox environment. Um, you run them in a unique origin. And what does it mean? Uh, normally, your origin is the triplet from your protocol, your port, and uh, uh, your domain. Well, whenever you're running a new iframe that is sandboxed, it will generate, at that moment, a new, unique uh, origin definition. And that is actually completely separated from all the other origins running on that page or running in your browser. So even if you sandbox two different iframes in your page, they will run each in their own random context at that moment. Um, what another definition, by default, if you're actually using the sandbox attribute, you're disallowing any JavaScript to execute in that context, which is a nice behavior in some reasons. This is also the way why you could actually defeat some of the frame busting uh, solutions I, I mentioned before. And other things, there are restrictions on forms, on pop-ups, on mo mouse movement, and on navigation. But I won't discuss them in detail. Um, but for most of the applications we see in using sandboxed uh, iframes, these are very hard restrictions. It actually means it's content, it's content, it's content. You can't execute anything, you can't do anything interesting once you're in a sandboxed environment. So they actually also put up some restrictions and that all the directives you give together with the sandbox environment. You could say that you allow forms or pop-ups. I think what's interesting, you can allow scripts to execute, you can allow navigation of the outer frame, or you could also say, well, they're actually running in the same origin, I don't need the unique origin. What I think you would use most is actually allowing scripts and leave all the other options open to protect you against the other attacks. But careful. So we have relaxations. With relaxations, there's also coming some uh, caveats. Here it is if you're combining the allow scripts with allow the same origin. What you create is actually you're splitting up with sandboxes two different execution contexts. But you, again, you're putting them in the same origin. You're putting JavaScript enabled. But what every frame can do is actually ask his parent, can I execute some code? Well, they are running in the same origin, so you can actually really escape your sandboxed environment. So never combine those two directives. As well, you could actually say, I'm not using a sandboxed environment for this purpose. And also notice, you can't re-enable plugins. I also think this is a good idea. Maybe we should find some way of actually making sure that all our pages are having this default behavior that are disabling plugins by default. OK. One thing, how many websites are using sandbox technology? Um, I was doing this scan uh, back in March last year, so I didn't do a, a rescan because I need to look into the body. I only had access to the headers uh, for this presentation, but none of the websites were using it. And also, we don't see that much uptake of people actually using this technology in the near future. Although I think it's a very interesting technology because it actually allows you to confine some of the content of your application for instance, your PR de department has some interesting pages that need to be embedded in your page, but you can put restrictions because you have different trust levels in each of the parts of your website that are combined. Also, good hope for people that only want to have one kind of technology in their browser specifying the security technology. Also, the sandboxing is coming to the CSP technology. Uh, we can actually have the sandbox, which is the general sandbox, having all the restrictions. You could also use the sandbox and having some relaxations as well as part of CSP 1.1. The same options apply as they apply in the sandbox HTML5, but here you actually can su uh, submit them on the server side saying which are the restrictions that need to be embedded with your particular page. So you could use either of them. Here you actually can combine them if necessary because they give you a whole view what are the security technologies embedded on top of my uh, particular application. So a small recap, um, I have been showing some examples on uh, how to use X-Frame options. Uh, we see that it's integrated in CSP. Similarly, we have been seeing HTML5 Sandbox. We could use the same origin policy even if we're running in the same origin. 
and also that part is being integrated in CSP as well. Any questions on this? When you are using the the kind of things uh, attributes for iframe, yeah. you mentioned that the, the plugin uh, with this demo. Yes. Does it mean that you cannot you cannot uh, start uh, Java assets in a, in an iframe moving kind of thing? Yeah, indeed, that's true. So if you would need that particular case, I would personally advise you to actually run that part in a separate origin and making sure that that actually doesn't have any impact on the code you're running yourself if you don't trust that applet. If you have full trust in the applet, um, you, you might run it in the same application, but if you say I already want to sandbox it because I don't have full trust, my advice would be just make sure it's uh, running in a separate origin. You define an additional DNS name, uh, which is I my website plugins.com or whatever, and you're actually are automatically getting the same for free, namely the separation between your two origins. Uh, personally, when I see so many uh, vulnerabilities in Java and Flash uh, in, in the past two years, my advice would be rethink if you really need an applet or Flash in your particular case, because you're actually pushing your users to install uh, software plugins that might be also under attack in drive-by download attacks, any other malware installation on your browser. But I, I think there are good cases where you say I need it, and for that user base, I'm allowing to install Flash. Okay, my proposal is to go to the next item, and actually here we're combining different technology together. I'm certainly not saying that this is the real security architecture you have to use tomorrow. It's just showing <coughs> an example how you could combine some of the technology together and getting some of the guarantees for free by combining this when starting or, or, or designing your new application. So it's harder to retrofit this on existing applications, but at least it shows what is the potential of those technologies already in the design phase of your new application. I'm combining CSP, I'm combining HTML5 Sandbox, and this is a technology that was presented by MyQuest at DevOps 2012, and this is actually the, the architecture that's being used to render documents, Word documents for instance, in the Chrome OS. So it's already in that technology they are trying to make sure that they're using the latest technology to getting some security features from free because you actually have to run some arbitrary untrusted JavaScript in some contexts. So the example, um, how do we do it, the security architecture? We have a main site, we have some fragments of untrusted JavaScript or untrusted content we have to run within our application. We only want to display something to the user as end result of that execution, but we don't trust that execution to run within the security context of our own application. So we create a sandboxed JavaScript execution environment. This is very high level. What do we do? We make sure that there's communication between the main site and this sandboxed environment. So here and here, any execution can happen. It doesn't have any access to the origin of the main website. But as, the, as a result, it can generate, for instance, an HTML string, something that needs to be rendered to the end user. And that is coming back via web messaging. That is the idea of this kind of architecture. How do we realize that? Well, the first one, if you want uh, having a sandboxed JavaScript execution, we do it with a sandboxed iframe, but we're still allowing uh, JavaScript executions. By default, it will run in a separate origin, so it doesn't have any access to our uh, stored data in the origin, to our cookies, to the application itself. It can't use issue XHR from our origin, so it's already quite some protection uh, with respect to our main site. Secondly, the main site itself, we're getting back HTML context from the sandboxed environment and we want to include it on the main site. What we do is actually we're loading it with CSP and by default CSP will make sure that any content we're adding to the main site as part of our main site will not contain any execution of JavaScript. So even if the string that is generated within the sandboxed environment is actually having some XSS as part of that uh, string, CSP will render that execution harmless within the main site because it will not execute because it will be an inline script. <coughs> so how does that look in practice? Um, we start with our main page. We say we are running scripts from ourselves and from no other origin. And this is needed to make sure that that untrusted sandboxed execution has no impact. We are loading this page. We are seeing that we have a sandboxed iframe here and we allow scripts to be run. And that's about it. We are also running some uh, external JavaScript, externalized JavaScript as part of the main site, and I will show that later on. So how does the sandbox iframe look like? 
Um, it's a lot of code just, just jumping in. What this do is this is the post message to actually say we're receiving messages from other uh, origins. What we do is we extract the context to execute. We call some functions within that sandboxed iframe and they can do harm but only in a random origin so they can't harm our main site. And whenever the, we have the result back which is a string, we actually post that back to the origin where the request came from. So we're actually pushing back the result to the main site. And next what we do on the main site, um, there we actually say, again we have here uh, a, a post message where we actually interact with the iframe. Whenever we get something back, wait, sorry, uh, whenever we actually um, are getting, um, well, whenever we are clicking, we're actually pushing a message to our iframe to actually execute the context. Whenever we're getting something back from our post message, we're getting some content back. We're taking the content that is coming by via that line. This may be fully untrusted HTML with JavaScript. You normally would never add that as part of your HTML tree, as part of your DOM. But because of CSP, we can add that to our data in our mainframe. And CSP will actually make sure that it's only data being represented. There will be no uh, execution of JavaScript. So this is one application. Um, this is a little bit uh, orthogonal to what I said earlier. It's an additional line of defense. Here they are really using it to protect themselves against executions. Um, but you could see this in a larger context where you say in this execution and this post message here, you're already doing some input validation, some encoding to make sure that nothing bad can happen. But in case something is missed, CSP will make sure that it doesn't harm the main website. That is actually the message I want to bring. Don't only rely on CSP, but it's all the combination of CSP with all the traditional techniques against CSS to be used here in this context. And this is already a more advanced architecture to be used. One more thing about how to integrate and how to use sandboxed environments within the future. Uh, one of the ways we actually could make it even more attractive to use sandboxed environment in the future is by combining two additional attributes within our iframe context. Seamless could actually make a seamless integration so you don't have any variation style between the outer frame and the inner frame, making it much more uh, transparent to actually go in and, and put all your data that's untrusted in an iframe, but for the end user it looks like one uh, block that you're sending it. It's one page, not a combination of different iframes. And secondly, instead of actually making an iframe always a new page within your uh, web application. With SourceDoc, you could actually specify a string that will be rendered inside the iframe. I think both of the techniques are already being part of the HTML5 specification, but I think there's no browser already combining Sandbox, Seamless, and SourceDoc all at once in your browser. But I think if those would be combined, and if the browser actually implement this, this would be a very nice way to say all the untrusted data within your application, after you have done all the encodings, after you've done all the uh, validations, you actually make sure that it's bound in an iframe. It can't execute anymore because you don't allow scripts. It's seamlessly integrated and you don't have to make additional pages for each of the content. You can do it in one line where you say all the information that needs to be rendered in the iframe is part of your page itself. But this is future music. Uh, at this moment, we can't actually use this because I don't think any browser is actually having three attributes at the same time. Okay, with this, I think I presented a lot of technologies today. I think hopefully you heard already some of them in previous talks, so it's not all new information to be captured today. I tried to give you some more context on how they were deployed, on how to use them. You also saw in the, the example architecture how things can be combined. And I'm really very hopeful in the near future that we will see more of those items popping up. But in web security, we have been very ad hoc in actually fixing vulnerabilities, actually having a whole list of coding guidelines. I think we will still have to, to apply to those coding guidelines, but I think there's a very large potential in actually having some of the security policies being clearly defined on the server side, and actually the, the very close to the executions, namely in the browser, they're actually enforcing that kind of security policies. So we saw a whole new range of security features. Um, it's a combination of the security features with existing coding guidelines, and I think uh, within two or three years, there will be several presentations all using this kind of technology within the web context. 
And with this, I have some references in the document. We don't go over this, but all of the material that is presented here, you can find some parts of that there. I already presented the handbook that we developed within Struce, actually bundling a lot of security know-how in web security within the handbook. And with this, I'm actually open to any question or to discuss any of the website securities later on tonight. Thank you. <laughs> so, any remaining question? Yeah, sure. I just want to be clear that when you allow scripts there, you're only protecting <laughs> your domain against scripts run from the attacker site. But if they wanted to launch a JavaScript to scan your network, that's going to run perfectly. Fine. Yeah, that's true. So you're really protecting the assets that are part of your of main.js or main.html. But everything else can still happen. So they could still run beef. They could still run Metasploit as part of that. Th that's something that. And, and that's also something that maybe is an interesting remark. Even if you would like to protect a website very uh, uh, strongly against attackers, they're still allowed to run any particular website. So if they are visiting any other website, they might still have malware that is doing a drive-by download, actually compromising the web. And this makes it very hard in client-side security to give any guarantee. So the only thing you can do is actually leveraging on the same origin policy, saying the browser is not owned by an attacker. And in that given context, you're trying to protect your own origin. But once that is happening, all bets are off, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The public key pins is in the Chromium source code, so it should be supported, I guess, in Chrome. OK, so it should be supporting Chrome, the, the public pinning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any so uh, Philips just says that within the source of Chromium, public pinning is still in there, so it should be supported. But I can't give you any guarantee. And even if only one browser is supporting it, Maybe it's too early to deploy it already in your company. Maybe I, I was, I was uh, explaining to you wrong because I, I think that the, the thing that Chrome do the way was they support. Uh, it was a, a previous uh, pinning. Uh, yeah, indeed, th th that's true. So the reason why they actually went to public pinning was they had before some pinning support and they dropped that in favor of public pinning. So that, that's correct. So nice to have all the additional information. I saw other questions as well. Yes, indeed. But uh, this means it does not receive the cookies anymore, or does it? No, it doesn't receive the cookies. So how do you maintain this? So what you could do there, and I'm just now, if I have this architecture and have to, as a developer try to, to fix this, one of the things you could do is actually from your cookie or from your website, generate a token which, which you could say the sandbox environment is still allowed to do XHR to your backend. It knows that it comes from an untrusted environment, so it can't do all the functionality, but you can actually delegate some of the access. So it's very resembling to what is, was presented in access control. You delegate with least privilege. You could generate a token in combination with server-side communication, saying with that token you can do some functionality, but very limited. But it's, of course, it, it's, it's much more difficult than just saying I'm running this script directly in my website. But this is what you have to pay. Whenever you say, well, I want to make sure that attacks are really, really limited to certain parts of the website, then you have to do com uh, compartmentalization, and this also has uh, an impact on functionality. That, that's true. Other questions? So see you all with the dinner. Thank you.